from the community, from Germantown, from Mount Airy, uh, Chestnut Hill, uh, PAFA for joining us. Um, Diane was kind enough to invite me to give this talk today. And I also asked her, she asked me why I agreed to give it. And I said, <laughs> um, I, was so I said, to have her. <laughs> I said, because you're my neighbor in Germantown and I love, I love our history and um, in this area. And uh, Henry Tanner has a lot of ties to Mount Airy and to Germantown. So um, the, the Tanner family in particular lived in Mount Airy and Tanner had many friends who lived in, in Germantown. So it's just a really rich um, historical part of our city. And I'm always happy to um, be involved with my Germantown neighbors and friends. Um, so without further ado, I will get started. Um, and then hopefully we will have time for discussion afterwards. And my son has been whisked away by one of my friends. So I'm all yours. <laughs> All right. Um, so Henry also a Tanner, um, born in 1859 and died in 1937, grew up in Philadelphia just after the Civil War, part of an educated and cultured African American elite. The son of a form of the formerly enslaved Sarah Tanner and AME African Methodist Episcopal Bishop Benjamin Tanner. It was in the summer of 1872, the same year that the family had moved into a large eight room home on 2908 Diamond Street in North Philadelphia, that young Tanner decided he wanted to become a painter. During a walk with his father through Fairmont Park, the young Tanner spied a stranger painting a large tree. On the spot, he decided that he too would become an artist, securing 15 cents from his parents later that evening for his first purchase of quote, dry colors and a couple of scraggy brushes. Thus began a journey of discovery for the young artist that began in Philadelphia and continued in Paris, Cairo, Jerusalem and Tangier. Henry Tanner went on to become a critically acclaimed and prize winning artist in the United States and France for what contemporary critics called his quote, modern and personal religious painting. For decades, he was a leader of the international artist community in Etable in Northern France. He counted among his patrons, the French government, millionaires of the Gilded Age, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, American universities and major American museums all during his lifetime. He is an American artist of international stature contemporary with other American expatriates like Sargent and Whistler, an artist who reframed genre scenes of African-American life and Orientalist and religious paintings through his innovative modern painting practice and techniques. The canonical survey and American art history as a whole acknowledge Henry Tanner as a progenitor figure in and a leading influence on African-American art history. In Framing American Art, a respected textbook of American art history, author Francis Pohl devotes a section specifically to Henry Oswa Tanner, not in the chapter on late 19th century art with transatlantic roots of the Gilded Age, nor in the section on American modernism, but is a precursor to the section on the Harlem Renaissance. Though Tanner was indeed an acknowledged influence on the artists of this movement, this slightly awkward placement is emblematic of Tanner's perceived place in American art history. As scholars have argued when Tanner is included in surveys of American and Western art, his of is usually represented by one of his genre paintings of African-American life, of which the artist made only two. Exhibitions throughout the last century in major humanities scholarship leave Tanner's legacy as the patriarch of African-American art history undisputed, yet often pigeonhole his career as that of a major black artist. And in our book and exhibition, we complicate this story by exploring the important influences of the AME church, his uh, teacher like Thomas Aikens, European Orientalism, 
modern technology and artistic developments, and World War I on Tanner's life and work. In doing so, we add important dimensions to the story of Tanner as a Black artist struggling to make his way in, in competitive art world, at the same time revealing him as a modernist whose training, intelligence, and faith equipped him to surmount the difficult realities of his time and propelled him into a lifetime of artistic discovery. Tanner was born on June 21st, 1859, the first of nine children in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Benjamin Tucker Tanner, who was a second generation freedman and third generation resident of Pittsburgh, and Sarah Elizabeth Miller, who was born enslaved in Winchester, Virginia. Sarah and Benjamin met when they were students at Avery College just outside Pittsburgh. Benjamin Tanner went on to study at Western Theological Seminary and became an eminent minister in the AME Church. In addition to raising nine children, Sarah Tanner also organized the Might Missionary Society of the AME Church, one of the earliest societies of Black women in America. So it wasn't only Tanner who was a leader, it was his whole family. His middle name, Oswa, was derived from Osawatomi, the town in Kansas, where in 1856, the white militant abolitionist John Brown launched his anti-slavery campaign. Tanner enrolled at PAFA in 1879 and was one of the first African-Americans to study there. As early as the 1830s, Robert Douglas Jr., a noted Black Philadelphia artist, had studied at the Academy and exhibited there in 1834. Paintings from Tanner's early days as a student at PAFA show his engagement first with animal subjects. That's what he was in, that's what he thought he wanted to do when he started out. So pomp at the zoo, a boy with a sheep lying under the tree, lion licking his paw. Um, Pomp was an old lion at the Philadelphia Zoo, where Aikens encouraged his students to visit, to study, and draw from animals. Tanner was also so devoted to animal painting that he purchased a sheep at one time to serve as a model for his pastoral compositions, but he quickly got tired of the sheep. He said it was not a very good poser for him. Tanner's first stab at the elevated academic genre of history paintings began under the tutelage of Aikens. Tanner had a great respect for and was in turn respected by Aikens, who had a profound influence on him. Tanner wrote later in life, quote, about this time, Mr. Thomas Aikens, under whom I was studying at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, gave me a criticism which aided me then and ever since. It may apply to all walks of life. I will pass it along. I had made the start on a study, and I actually think he's talking about this painting here, um, which was not altogether bad, but very probably the best thing I had ever done. He encouraged, but instead of working to make it better, I became afraid I should destroy what I had done and really did nothing the rest of the week. Well, he was disgusted. What have you been doing? Get it, get it better, or get it worse. No middle ground for compromise. That seems to, that really resonated with Tanner and Aiken's instruction technique. History and genre paintings were popular subjects for Tanner's teachers, uh, Aiken's and Thomas Hovenden. The subject Tanner chose for his first foray into this ambitious genre was the legend of Androcles, a Roman slave who sought shelter from slavery in the cave of a lion. Androcles befriended the lion by removing a thorn from the lion's paw. Later, the slave was captured by the Romans and sentenced to die at the hands of wild beasts in the Circus Maximus. The beast turned out to be the lion that Androcles had saved, and the lion bowed to him as would a domesticated pet. This touching sight inspired the Roman emperor to release both the lion and Androcles. The subject may have held particular resonance for Tanner, given the fact that his own mother had been born into slavery and had been brought to Pennsylvania by the Underground Railroad. Two studies exist for this painting, study for Androcles and lion licking its paw. These studies uh, show how accomplished an artist Tanner was becoming as a student at PAFA. And it's unfortunate that he never finished this painting. 
The lion here is portrayed with great sensitivity. When one compares it to the previous uh, work of Pomp, you can see how much progress Tanner has made. His figure of the sinewy Androcles likewise reflects the hours Tanner put into drawing at the Academy's cast collection and live models. He had clearly absorbed Aiken's lessons in gritty realism as well as scientific observation of the human anatomy. However, Tanner claimed that, quote, the ambitious canvas was beyond him, and he spent he had spent all his money on models without finishing the picture, whose scope, the artist argued, was beyond him at the time. By the late 1880s, Tanner had given up wanting to be an animal painter, though he would continue to depict lions throughout his career. In this period, Tanner refined his landscape painting practice. One of his most exceptional landscapes from this period is Sand Dunes, Atlantic City. Tanner spent many of his summers working in the black resort industry in Atlantic City, beginning in the summer of 1876, and received encouragement from other painters working in the area. This landscape is in many ways a smaller scale version, version of monumental landscapes being displayed at PAFA in the mid 1880s. Tanner would have seen the work of his fellow PAFA student, Alexander Harrison. For example, um, his board de mer was exhibited in 1885, um, and also Harrison's award-winning The Wave was painted in Concarneau, France, approximately one year before Sand Dunes, which was, uh, and um, also um, Harrison's painting was a prize winner at PAFA. And the painting I'm showing you here, Sand Dunes, is actually in the collection of the White House. And I took the photograph on the right myself. Um, gosh, it feels like a different world when I could make an appointment at the White House and um, go and take this picture, climb up on a ladder. <laughs> um, and I actually got to meet uh, Bo Obama, the White House dog at the time. Um, I didn't get to see Michelle or Barack, um, but uh, this, was, this painting was the first painting by an African-American added to the White House collection. And it was done um, by Hillary Clinton. Um, that's how long it took to get a work by an African-American in the White House. Um, so uh, I was not able to borrow it for the show, but I was able to see it in person, which was a wonderful experience. After a brief foray in Atlanta, Tanner arrived in Paris in 1891, including a brief stop, stopover en route to Rome. But he stayed and studied in Paris at the, he was going to go to Rome, but he decided to stay at, and study at the Academie Julienne. As a student at the school, Tanner had weekly access to models from which he created academies or drawing from the live models. And I'm just showing you here um, a few landscapes that he did in his years in Atlanta. You can see he's still thinking about landscape painting and watercolor and this beautiful um, work that he did in the summer in North Carolina. And here, another work that is in um, Georgia. So here we are back in Paris. So uh, on the left, um, this uh, accomplished drawing of a Negro man, it show, represents one of the academies or drawings from the live model. Tanner's training at PAFA, prepared him well for his work at Julien, as one can see by the masterful handling in this particular drawing. In addition to weekly drawing sessions, the students at Julien were offered critiques by eminent artists. And two of the tutors during Tanner's time were Jean-Paul Lorenz and Jean-Joseph Benjamin Constant. Constant in particular had a lasting influence on Tanner, particularly on his early paintings of the Near East. And we'll talk a little bit more about those later. A small group of urban landscapes from Tanner's first years in Paris show him developing under the style of uh, French Impressionism and uh, also James a Abbott McNeil Whistler his fellow American expatriate and internationally acclaimed artist. Whistler celebrated, celebrated for his nocturnal views of London from the 1870s, appears to have influenced Tanner's early work in Paris, such as two of his first nocturnal view of the Seine looking towards Notre Dame and the Seine evening. 
These newly discovered Whistlerian works show Tanner particularly intrigued by nighttime illumination in Paris. Tanner's interest in nocturnes continued into his famous religious paintings, and he would also return to urban nocturnes during the period of World War I. Like many artists studying in Paris in the late 19th century, Tanner left the city for the French countryside in the summer. In the summers of 1891 and 1892, he traveled to Brittany on the western coast of France. And whilst there continued his experimentation in landscape and branched out into genre or scenes of everyday life, focusing on scenes of French peasant life. Tanner completed three major French genre scenes during this time, the bagpipe lesson, the bagpipe player, and the young sabot maker. These paintings were Tanner's first submissions to the French salon. Unlike the small landscapes he completed, these large paintings reflect the influence of leading French salon painters. So he's, he's thinking about the Impressionists, but he's also thinking about these salon painters. These works represent Tanner's return to narrative painting. It's natural that Tanner should have turned to such scenes to make his way in Paris, as many of his contemporaries from PAFA were also working in Brittany in the summer during the same time including Cecilia Bowe, Alexander Harrison, and Charles Sprague Pierce. Tanner's narrative paintings were popular and successful in his native Philadelphia. In an article, The Negro in Art, H.O. Tanner's Latest Triumph, which was published in the AME Church Review of July 1897, the author stated, quote, we recall now that we once saw in the great Wanamaker store in Philadelphia, a picture by Mr. Tanner, for which we were told the merchant prince paid a snug sum. This painting that was shown at Wanamaker's was in all probability the bagpipe lesson, which had hung at Wanamaker's Philadelphia Art Gallery in September of 1894 and his New York Gallery in 1897, in which Wanamaker partner, Robert C. Ogden hoped to purchase this painting for PAFA by subscription. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get it. And eventually um, Ogden donated it to Hampton University where he was also a trustee. John Wanamaker, the owner of Wanamaker's department store empire was also a patron of, teachers, of, of Tanner's teacher, Hovenden. And the mercantile magnet owned the latter's breaking home ties in, and he displayed that in his home. And, and that painting now you can see in the collection of the PMA. Tanner used his time in Brittany, absorbing the influence of modern French academic tradition of peasant genre scenes, as well as time exhibiting with Hovenden to create innovative paintings of African-Americans based on traditional genre scenes. He did this by creating respectful naturalistic depictions that stood in sharp contrast to caricatured 19th century visual representations. Tanner was not the first American artist to include African Americans in genre scenes, particularly scenes of music making. Similar genre paintings by Hovenden and Aikens were popular in Philadelphia. Tanner's teacher Aikens had painted Negro Boy Dancing in 1877, and this tradition reaches back at, at least into the 1840s in American art. However, Tanner's unique contribution is the humanity pathos and virtuoso technique that he applies to this genre. He adapted what he learned from his teachers at PAFA as well as what he learned in Paris and Brittany and infused it in his own early masterworks. His iconic genre series from this period include The Banjo Lesson, The Thankful Poor, and spinning by the firelight. Tanner would pay homage as well to his own upbringing during his brief time back in the US when he created one of his few surviving sculptures, bust of Benjamin Tucker Tanner from 1894. This patinated plaster bust shows Bishop Tanner deep in thought, almost as if he is in the process of composing a sermon or speech. With his faraway gaze and prominent cross hanging at his neck, the sculptor cast him as a formidable figure, both intellectual and religious, a leader of this world, pondering the world beyond. And here you can see a photograph of Tanner sculpting. 
Portrait of the Artist's Mother is a reinterpretation and personalization of Whistler's arrangement in gray and black, which Tanner had the opportunity to see while a student at PAFA when it was exhibited there in 1881. Another PAFA artist likewise influenced by the painting was Cecilia Beau, who did her own version, Les Derniers Jours d'Enfance, in 1885. In 1891, the year of Tanner's arrival in Paris, the French government purchased Whistler's portrait of his mother, and in 1897, they purchased Tanner's Raising of Lazarus, which we'll get to. Scholars have certainly connected the Whistler and Tanner paintings of their mothers, suggesting that Tanner's visit to his parents' home in 1897 was a celebratory visit after the French government's purchase of Lazarus to hang with arrangement of gray and black in the galleries of the Musée du Luxembourg. The painting should not then be interpreted as in competition with Whistler, but as a text that the artist was rewriting for his own purposes. Tanner's mother is comparatively relaxed in contrast to the rigid puritanical pose of Whistler's mother. Both Beau and Tanner use reddish brown Rembrandt-esque tones as opposed to Whistler's cool tones. This would have been keeping with Tanner's old master palette at the time, similar in the raising of Lazarus. A pensive melancholia pervades both Beau and Tanner's compositions, similar to tonalist portraits of the time. A major shift occurs in Tanner's career trajectory in 1896. Dewey Mosby, um, the late Dewey Mosby has astutely pointed out that although Tanner submitted both the banjo lesson and the bagpipe lesson to the French salon, it was the latter with quote, Brittany denizens that was given a medal while paintings with a quote, distinctive race influence and character were ignored. Tanner's shift away from genre paintings, as well as his decision to pursue religious paintings in that moment in American and French history was very timely and must be thought of as a strategic reaction to the pressures of the market, as well as a reflection of the artist's genuine religious sentiment and upbringing. Tanner received his first major recognition in France with his Daniel in the Lion's Den, unfortunately now lost which was awarded honorable mention at the Salon. An article in the October 1897 AME Church Review advised readers that, quote, American art journals first began to apprise their public of the rising new star in Mr. Tanner when they're hung in the Philadelphia Gallery of Fine Arts, Daniel in the Lion's Den, a subject in his favorite light effects. The Philadelphia Preachers Meeting of the AME Church purchased this picture for $1,000 and presented it to this gallery. This painting was exhibited at PAFA in December of 1896 and then toured nationally and internationally. And unfortunately, we have no idea where it is today. In the 1890s, Tanner was an integral part of a group of Americans in Paris. He shared a studio with Herman A. McNeil in 1893, and in the years around 1895 was immortalized on canvas by Herman Dudley Murphy and in plaster by his fellow PAFA alum, Charles Grafley, who would go on to become the head of our sculpture department. Tanner's major patrons in the 1890s were also part of this group, not only religious leaders, but also wealthy proponents and influential supporters of religious arts and artists. When in 1895, Tanner joined the American Art Association of Paris, American merchant Prince Rodman Wanamaker was president. Philadelphia's John Wanamaker, the father of Tanner's patron Rodman, was a major patron of religious art and had purchased works by the popular Hungarian religious artist Miheli Munkesi as early as February 9th, 1887. Munkesi's internationally famed Christ Before Pilate and Christ on Golgotha were both purchased in 1887 and they hung at John Wanamaker's country home outside Philadelphia until a fire in 1907 nearly destroyed them. Now they not only hung in his home, but then around Easter every year Wanamaker would bring them and hang them by the organ at Wanamaker's department store, which is now Macy's. Um, and I just bring this up so we think, you know, about uh, religion and art and 
shopping in the late 19th century and how they were all intertwined in Philadelphia. Was it his fellow Philadelphian Wanamaker whose family had been contem collecting contemporary religious art for over a decade who encouraged Tanner to take up religious painting? More likely, it was a confluence of factors in addition to Tanner's own deeply religious upbringing that led him to infuse a modernity into religious painting, thus becoming one of America's leading international artists at the turn of the century. These factors likely include his interaction with symbolist artists in Brittany and naturalist religious artists in Paris that contributed to his moving away from genre painting to religious art, as well as the sensational international popularity of the artist Pascal Adolphe Jean Dagnan Bouveret's The Lord's Last Supper in the city of Paris at the Salon de Champ de Mars in 1896. Also, it's likely that Tanner was impressed by James Tissot's watercolor series, The Life of Christ. And I'm showing you here another Dagnan Bouvray and a Tanner, um, which premiered in Paris in 1894 and toured select Northeast US cities along with Chicago in 1898 before the series was purchased by the Brooklyn Museum in 1900. In the summer of 1896, Tanner began his work on the resurrection of Lazarus, which continued for six months. Tanner began Lazarus by working with a much larger canvas, six by 10 feet, which he claimed a friend had told him to use. However, he soon gave that up and returned to a smaller canvas that he had chosen initially. Tanner scholars, as well as contemporary reviewers, have noted his dramatic use of light, his monumental scale, and his brown and gold coloration. In Tanner's Lazarus, the source of light seems to be the miracle, the resurrected Lazarus. Light spills out from the white drapery of Lazarus to illuminate a crowd of spectators emerging from the shadows. Tanner's spectators are brought into the light via the miracle occurring before them. Tanner's painting, however, is much more intimate than Dagnan Bouveret's, which we saw before. And the rigid centrality of Dagnan Bouveret's Christ contrasts significantly with Tanner's more humble representation of Jesus. Perhaps this is why so many critics saw Tanner's paintings as being infused with, quote, more, quote, personal religious feeling. Both Tanner and Harrison Morris, who was the director of PAFA, wanted Lazarus to travel to Philadelphia. However, the French government who controlled the Luxembourg Museum where the painting was purchased would not loan it for reasons that are unclear. In a letter dated September 22nd, 1897, Tanner wrote to Morris, quote, I am sorry to say my picture will not come to Philadelphia as I desired. Of this, I am somewhat disappointed. Despite Morris's repeated attempts to get the painting to Philadelphia, Tanner again told him on December 25th, 1897, that the cause was lost. Morris lamented that French bureaucracy would not allow the painting to come to the US. Quote, we realize how difficult it would be to change the position taken by government officials, which you yourself have approved of. So I'm pleased to say that uh, even though Tanner and Morris tried in the 1890s to get the painting to, um, to Philadelphia, it never did come in his lifetime. And it wasn't until 2012 that it finally crossed the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, came to Philadelphia and then traveled to Cincinnati and the MFA Houston. I have to say, this is one of the proudest moments of my career. Um, I'm here at the Musée d'Orsay with my colleague, Amber Kerr, who is a conservator from the Smithsonian. Um, we're looking at Lazarus, with, which wasn't even on view at the Orsay, because as you can see, it was sort of hanging out of its frame. Um, but it was in, it was in great condition. Um, but not, um, not showable. So one of the ways we got this to Philadelphia is uh, we paid for the most expensive piece of glass I will ever pay for in my life um, <laughs> to have the French government 
retrofit the frame and glaze the work and have it travel uh, to the US, which um, was, was very, very exciting. And another thing that we discovered, uh, we also borrowed this painting, The Disciples at Emmaus from the French government. And uh, we discovered that um, underneath this painting was this painting, La Musique. And you can see, you see the, the glow here, which is actually, this is a portrait of Henry Tanner's um, wife, Jessie, who was an opera singer playing the cello. You can actually see the Graffley bust of Tanner in the background. Um, and he submitted this to the salon, uh, but uh, it got rejected. So he recycled the camp canvas and did the Disciples at Emmaus, which then gets bought by the French government. So, um, Okay, on, um, so on his return to Paris um, from the US and also a trip to the Middle East that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, um, Tanner built upon the success of Daniel in the lion's den and Lazarus with his salon submissions, The Annunciation and Nicodemus. It was also in this year that Tanner met his future wife, Jessie Macaulay Olson, a Swedish American woman from San Francisco who was training to be an opera singer in Paris. They would marry in 1899 and have their only child, Jessie Asawa Tanner, in 1903. In 1900, the critic Vance Thompson stated with the, that with the Annunciation and Nicodemus visiting Jesus, Tanner was destined to give the world a new conception of the Bible and that, quote, Monsieur Tanner is not only a biblical painter, but he has brought to modern art a new spirit. Critics during Tanner's time were aware that Tanner was creating a modernist vision of the Bible, not primarily engaging in illustration, as was Tissot, but creating a unique and deeply personal vision. In addition to his own mystical treatments of the landscape of the Holy Land, one of the ways Tanner achieved this modern spirit was by infusing uniquely contemporary elements, such as the visual culture of electricity and modern dance into age old biblical subjects, such as the Annunciation and Salome. So a major deviation from Tanner's typical religious paintings can be found on his Salome, which is dated 1902 to 03. The painting first appears in Tanner li literature though in 1924, and it may never have been exhibited in Tanner's lifetime. Indeed, its bold sensuality is not in keeping with the rest of his oeuvre. The dramatic color and light effects in the application of oil paint suggest that it was made in the years immediately following 1900. In that year, Tanner would have had been able to see his compatriot, Loie Fuller, dancing her famous electric, electric Salome dance at the Exposition Universelle. Tanner exhibited two paintings, Christ Among the Doctors and Daniel in the Lion's Den, at the Exposition Universelle. And Fuller, who had her own theater at the exposition, was at the time the most famous American in Paris. Fuller was known for her fully clothed dances where her voluminous billowing drapery was dramatically lit from below. Tanner's Salome, like Fuller's, was also lit from below, almost as if a glare of electric light is casting a greenish glow on the biblical dancer's face. Tanner and Fuller were far from the only artists for whom Salome was an object of fascination at the turn of the century. Other symbolist artists were painting Salome as the quintessential femme fatale, including Gustave Moreau and Franz von Stucke. In 1907 and 1908, Tanner completed his largest canvas ever, the, Wa the Wise and Foolish Virgins, another painting that Wanamaker owned that is lost. Newly discovered documentary evidence at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania suggests that this suggested to me that this painting uh, was commissioned by Rodman Wanamaker for the department store, which explains why the painting was so out of scale, 11 foot six inches tall and 16 feet wide with Tanner's other works. The figures were life-size and depicted in a grand interior. Wanamaker also owned versions of Return of the Holy Women, Christ and his mother studying the, the scriptures. 
the wise and foolish versions was hung in the most prominent of all Wanamaker's galleries, his Munkasey Gallery Annex, which was on the ninth floor of the flagship Wanamaker's Gallery in Philadelphia, at the, 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 the department store, sorry. There it hung alongside Munkasey's pri priceless treasures, along with paintings like Benjamin's West, Benjamin West's Christ Blessing the Little Children until March of 1928, when an inventory was taken of those works on the death of Rodman Wanamaker. The prominent position of, in the Wanamaker store may have influenced another PAFA alumna, Violet Oakley, or her patrons to create her own stained glass version of the Wise and Foolish Virgins for St. Peter's Church in Germantown uh, in 1908 and 1909. And um, the, I'm, these stained glass windows, which were in Germantown are now in PAFA, at PAFA, so you can still see them. The painting, The Wise and Foolish Virgins, may have remained in the store throughout the 1930s as well, but then it was sold through Park Burnett Galleries in New York City in 1939, and there the trail goes cold. So please look for a very large rolled up painting in your attics and basements, everyone, and find The Wise and Foolish Virgins, and you'll change American art history forever. Tanner's lifelong use of photography to help us construct his figurative paintings is evident in the photographs of his wife, Jessie, and his son, young son, Jesse, that he used as an aid to construct two painted versions of Christ learning to read. Interestingly, the photographs of Jesse and Jesse are similar compositionally to Tanner's early photographic study for the banjo lesson. So, this idea of uh, passing on education and learning between generations is something that is really important to Tanner, not only in the banjo lesson and the bagpipe lesson and the sabo maker, but also in, in these scenes here. Technical attention to the play of light and shadow make these photographs more accomplished than his earlier photographs and suggest that Tanner was working with pictorialist photography practices in the 19 teens. At this time, Tanner infuses a diffuse spiritual atmosphere into his painting practices, and his paintings become less and less like the naturalist Dagna Bouveret and are imbued with Tanner's own brand of mysticism. So one of the paintings I fell in love with most when the show was up at PAFA was the Disciples See Christ Walking on the Water. Uh, done in 1907. They're really this inimitable mystical style. Um, in works like The Visitation or The Three Marys, Tanner manipulates light and shadow and paint to emphasize the reaction of his figures to the holy events unfolding just outside the frame of the canvas, drawing viewers into the painting, into the canvas. This allows the viewer of Tanner's paintings to almost be a part of the biblical story, creating a personal experiential moment rather than telling the viewer a story of an event that happened centuries before, as would a painter such as Tissot. And I'm comparing here to you uh, a, paint, a, a painting by Tissot. Jesus goes up to play alone in the mountain in the mountains to the disciples see Christ walking on the water where you can't even really tell um, what Christ is. He could be a beam of light. He could be an apparition. He could be a reflection of the moon. You know, it, um, it's really up to you. And one of the great essays in the catalog, uh, my colleague, Hélène Valence, who is a French scholar, uh, talked a lot about Tesla and his experimentations with electric light and light beams that were exhibited at the same Exposition Universelle as Loewy Fuller. And this idea of how Tanner took this latest innovations in electric light and infused that into his paintings where you can see the angel Gabriel is like a beam of light. Uh, there is like an after effect of a disappearing Christ. And again, here in, in my, my favorite painting, Christ walking on the water. Also, um, 
I'm comparing these two works, one by Claude Monet and one by Tanner in 1907. So you can see how Tanner is adopting um, impressionist principles into his paintings. And we do not tend to think of the impressionists as religious painters for the most part. Um, so Tanner really takes that modernist approach to, land, to, to landscape and puts it into his unique religious scenes. Um, after 1900, much of Tanner's time in France was spent at his home in Trepied on the northern coast of France, adjacent to the artist colony and beach resort of Paris Plage and the fishing village of Etaples. Tanner created numerous nocturnal landscapes, such as Le Touquet and the Calvary at Etaples, along with the genre scenes of the harsh life of the Etaples fishermen. Many of these paintings show fishermen returning for their la from labors. Um, scenes like fishermen returning at night, there are at least four versions of it. Prominent among many of these is a lantern, um, the figuring of which illuminates the artist's life song fascination with the effects of light and darkness. And you can see this sort of lantern light effect on the Calvary at a tap, which is where fishermen would pray to the statue of Christ before going out on a night of fishing. In 1917, after the United States entered World War I, Tanner, then 58, offered his contribution to the war effort by designing a Red Cross program to employ wounded and convalescing soldiers to raise fresh produce in hospital gardens. Tanner carried out this scheme on the Eastern front of the war in the area around Neuf Chateau, and he was named Assistant Director of Farm and Garden Services for the American Red Cross. A group of paintings and sketches done on the Eastern Front remain some of the most intriguing paintings from the artist's later career. In this period, Tanner excelled in merging the sacred and the secular, especially in nocturnal paintings suffused with deep purple and blue hues. Nearby um, this house shown here was the military hospital where Tanner worked growing vegetables for American soldiers. And this calm nocturne suggests a moment of repose and inspiration for Tanner and the soldiers he tended amidst the heart deprivations of wartime. I'm showing you here also a beautiful painting that he did at the um, end of World War I. It, it commemorates a moment when soldiers came back to Paris and the Arche de Triomphe was lit up with a temporary um, memorial to all the lost in, in, world, in world War I. And um, for many years, this painting was misdated 1914. Um, but our, our scholarship for the exhibition was able to securely date this at 1919, at the end of World War I. Tanner's success with the resurrection of Lazarus was inspired by uh, his patron, Rodman Wanamaker, paying for him to travel to the Holy Land. When he saw the painting in Tanner's studio, Resurrection of Lazarus, he said, quote, there is Orientalism in the Lazarus, but it was a fortunate accident. Tanner's first visit to the Near East was in 1897, during which time he traveled along a then popular itinerary to Cairo, Jerusalem, Port Said, Jaffa, Jericho, the Dead Sea, and Alexandria. After that trip, Tanner returned to Paris via Venice, and in the fall of 1898, Rodman Wanamaker planned another trip for Tanner to the Holy Land. Tanner's work from this period shows his indebtedness to the academic Orientalism of his teachers, Jean-Joseph Benjamin Constant. In invoking the word Orientalism, Wanamaker was most probably referring to the works of 19th century French painters like Constant, who used artistic elements derived from their travels in North Africa and the Near East to depict aspects of cultures other than their own in their paintings. Before traveling to Cairo and Jerusalem for, for the first time in 1897, Tanner had multiple opportunities to immerse himself in the contemporary visual culture of Orientalism, both in the US and France. In 1893, he had traveled to the Chicago's World's Fair to present the paper, The American Negro in Art at the Congress of Africa. 
an auxiliary Congress of the World's Columbian Exhibition. While there, he had the opportunity to visit the Street of Cairo attraction. This attraction recreated the architecture that one might find in a narrow lane in Cairo and included women performing the infamous belly dance for the first time in the US. In the same year in Paris, the Parisian Society of Orientalist Artists was formed and Jerome, who had been Thomas Aiken's teacher and Benjamin Constant, Tanner's teacher, were named honorary president. Both Tanner's work and that of Constant hit, um, reveal uh, this sort of uh, great embrace of this Orientalist tradition. Yet Tanner, like his American compatriot Sargent, who was also painting the architecture of the Muslim world of the time, seems to be more interested in the play of light in dark and dramatic space. And I'm showing you here some of um, the works that Tanner did in Cairo. Constant and Tanner employ a loose brushwork revealing the influence of naturalism and realism, um, different from the earlier generation of Jerome. Thus, when Wanamaker financed Tanner's first trip to the Holy Land, the artist was familiar with the images of the Orient that circulated in the US and France in the form of world's fairs, fine art exhibitions, and tourist photography. Um, these two paintings, interior of a mosque and a mosque in Cairo, uh, are probably done after the Circassian Mamluk Mosque complex of Kite Bay. Perhaps his first work from his travels um, to Cairo were his interior of a mosque. And uh, this was, uh, I'm showing you here a, a photograph that Tanner could have collected when he traveled to Cairo that he could have used to help him complete a canvas when he went back to Paris. They sort of, con they contain sort of similar elements that Tanner adapts when he goes back to Paris. In, 19, in the years after 1910, Tanner begins a series of visits to French North Africa. There's some evidence that even before he traveled to North Africa, he was using French postcards to construct paintings of the area. In 1911, the artist had an exhibition at the Thurber Art Galleries in Chicago, and he exhibited paintings titled Morocco and a Yemen Jew. This was actually before he visited Morocco. Both these subjects and other works, which we now only know by generic titles such as Yemen Jew, have their prototype in turn of the century French postcards. Like his Jerusalem types of a decade earlier, Tanner's architectural scenes of North Africa should be considered in light of the French mentality that constructed them. So uh, I think it's important to think about Tanner as being a, a man of his time and also being very influenced by French colonialism and imperialism that he would have soaked up in Paris. And, and this makes for a much more complicated way of looking at the, at the work of Tanner. You can see again here in his North African works, the, uh, the framework of French tourist photography and how it influenced him as well as stereographic views, which would, be, would have been very, very popular in all the World's Fairs exhibitions that he visited um, and were also popular souvenirs for um, Christian pilgrims who were visiting the Near East at the time. Again, uh, another one of these images from a sort of World's Fair exhibition with one of Tanner's paintings. And um, Tanner also uh, went to, um, he was in Algiers at the same time as Matisse and um, they stayed at the same hotel. And I'm showing you here a painting done by Matisse and Tanner about the same time. Tanner said, uh, Tanner did not, he thought Matisse was a very nice man, but he didn't think you could call him an artist. So that gives you an idea of where Tanner felt, fell. At, Tanner's by this time becoming a more conservative older artist, whereas Matisse is, is definitely part of the avant-garde. The period between the end of World War I and, the, and his death were difficult for Tanner. He lost his beloved wife in 1925 and suffered financial setbacks during the Great Depression. However, during this period, he was most successful in recreating familiar subjects in a new light. 
And in the 1920s, Tanner began to experiment with tempera painting as part of his own version of modernism. These last paintings form a very distinct body in Tanner's work and reveal innovations in technique. Tanner took copious notes on his experimentation with technique as part of the technical study and part of the technical study including, included in our catalog, Smithsonian scientists used the recipes found on the back of Tanner's paintings to recreate his material painting practice. These technical innovations, including Tanner's mixing of tempera and oil, are discussed in detail in the technical study of the catalog. So um, if you are interested in all of the science of Tanner's painting and, and figuring out how he used all these layers of paint, I, I would point you to that wonderful essay in the catalog. And these are some very detailed photography that my colleagues at the Smithsonian did as they were cleaning um, these paintings. You can see it in raking light. So you can see um, just how built up and almost sculptural his paintings are. And then you can see it flat, which that shows you the sort of tile-like uh, effect that he was going for with building up multiple layers of paint and glazing. In 1936, when James Porter was facilitating the purchase of Return from the Crucifixion for Howard University, Tanner wrote to him saying, quote, the figure groups have from the first gone rather well, except the Mary and St. John. These I have painted over several times. What you say about the landscape I hope, I, is I hope true. Palestine always impressed me as the background for a great tragedy. End quote. Porter later wrote that Tanner's unusual mixture of tempera and oil in combination, quote, allowed him to build up a particular surface or develop the seam in rough textures in the matter of basso relievo. In preparation for this painting, Tanner created the marvelous Conte crayon and charcoal sketch study for Mary. The differences between Tanner's sketch and the finished painting are remarkable. The sketch reveals the quality of the artist's draftsmanship, while the painting showcases how Tanner's experimental materials allowed him to create rough, highly built up landscapes, which the artist seems to have felt most successfully conveyed the feeling of tragedy that he experienced in the landscape of Palestine. The contrast suggests that while he used traditional academic techniques to begin his compositions, the final results were the products of years of modernist experimentation, creating a hybrid technique of modernist technical aspects and traditional subject matter. This was to be Tanner's final canvas. I wanna thank you all for coming today and I, we, I can stay late for questions. And I do want to say we are open at PAFA. <laughs> you can come visit us Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and you can see these works by Tanner and many, many, many more works on view in our beautiful galleries. And I'm going to stop the share. <laughs>